one of the most familiar paintings that is associated with Robert Campine uh, is the Moroda Annunciation Triptych, or sometimes just called the Moroda Altarpiece. It's in the cloisters in New York, uh, owned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art, although it's not at uh, the Metropolitan's uh, main building. Uh, it is in the uh, cloisters in Fort Tyrone Park. This is in multiple survey books. So when American students think of Robert Campin, this is often the first work of art that they think of. However, it is something that in some ways is quite controversial. There's two main issues. One is iconography of which many, many articles and books have been written. And the other is attribution. Who painted it? So we're going to talk about both of these. The first thing we'll talk about is the iconography and many of the things that has been said about this. Um, First, let's just show you what is on the different panels. In the center, there is an Annunciation. Uh, on the left side, as we're looking at it, we see the donors uh, looking through an open door to the room of the Annunciation. And in the right wing, there is St. Joseph in his carpenter's workshop. So let's look at each one of these panels, starting with the central panel, the Annunciation. In this case, the angel Gabriel is announcing the coming of Christ, the incarnation. Uh, it's taking place within a domestic interior filled with household objects. And this has been used as one of the main examples of uh, Panofsky's idea of disguised or hidden symbolism. Now, I should explain that a little bit. Um, Panofsky used that term when he was talking about naturalistic objects that had an additional symbolic meaning. However, evidently, over the years, students got confused with the term. And some of them had the strange idea that these symbols were hidden from the people of the time uh, to be discovered by the 20th century art historians, which of course is nonsense. No one knew there would be 20th century art historians. Any symbols that are in a painting would be something that would be understood by the audience for the painting. So, we don't usually say disguised or hidden symbolism anymore. And I've started using the term naturalistic objects that can also be symbols, sort of. Uh, and sometimes people don't like the word symbols, so maybe that refer to another idea. Well, there's many people that think that this painting is just filled with objects that have symbolic meaning. There are some other people who say, no, they're simply naturalistic objects. They don't have any additional symbolic meanings that add to um, the religious content of the painting. So I'm going to talk about um, what has been said about it, and let's think about what makes sense. Panofsky had a phrase, and he said that we had to temper it with common sense. I often say that the painting will tell you. Now, both of those seem very vague. Uh, we have to know something about what the sources uh, that were available in the 15th century, and we have to consider that when we're looking at works of art. But let's look at some of the objects in this room. Well, first I'm going to look at something that's um, 
no, not really a symbol, it's standing for what it is. In some annunciations, and this is one of them, the dove of the Holy Spirit does not appear. Instead, you have an image of a small, naked infant, the Christ child, carrying a cross on his shoulder and entering through the window. And in this case, you can see that you have seven golden rays. And this, of course, would be representing the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we've already talked about the symbolism of the light coming through the glass without breaking it, being analogous to Christ entering the womb of the Virgin and being born without destroying her virginity. So here, very clearly, is the incarnate uh, infant, you know, on his way to Mary. The angel seems to have just entered the room, is about to speak. Mary doesn't seem to have noticed him yet. Uh, she's seated uh, in what uh, Lauren Campbell calls an indeterminate position. Uh, is she on the kneeling bench? Is she on a cushion? Is she on the floor? Well, that's uh, not quite clear, but she's down there near the floor, uh, and she's reading as many uh, paintings of the Virgin Mary show. And next to her is this polygonal table. And on it are different still life objects. We have a, uh, a pitcher, uh, which would be an import from Spain, incidentally, um, an abarello. Uh, and from it, we see flowers, we see a candle and a candlestick and a book and a scroll. Now, people have suggested that these have symbolic meaning. We're very familiar with the idea of lilies representing the purity of the Virgin. But this is particularly interesting in the way that the artist has created the lilies. They have one stem and three flowers coming from that. Two are in bloom and one is still a bud. And it's been suggested that this represents the Trinity. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son is still unborn, not yet incarnate. So he's still, he's represented symbolically as a bud. Now the candle's quite interesting because there is a little spark in the wick. And then smoke is coming and wafting up from that burning wick. But it's not actually in flame yet. And so, you know, there's several ideas about what this means. Uh, the kind of naturalistic expl explanation, uh, if you can call an angel coming as a naturalistic explanation, uh, is that the angel has flown in to the room and the candle is blown out by the wind from the angel's swift entrance. And then it's been suggested sort of just the opposite, that the candle is being ignited miraculously, that the spark of Christ's divinity is there. You know, he's about to come into human flesh. And remember when we talked about Jan van Eyck uh, and his Annunciation, we also talked about this symbolism of the candle. Now, that might sound rather esoteric to many of us, but the source was something that was very readily available. The speculum humanae salvationis, or the mirror of human salvation, was one of these picture Bibles in which you would have a picture from the New Testament, seen from the life of Christ, for example, and there would be three Old Testament scenes that were types or prefigurations of this. And then it would have some verses uh, to explain the parallels. Uh, you'll remember we talked about the idea that Christians had that there were prophecies or omens given in the Old Testament that were sort of foreshadowing, you know, prophesying, uh, letting people know what would come later in the person of Christ. And according to the Speculum Humanae Salvationis, Christ is the candle. The wick of his divinity, the part that could ignite, is hidden by the wax of his humanity. 
you know, just looking at him, you'd say he's a human being, but there is uh, that hidden divinity, if you will. And then Mary is the candlestick. She holds and sustains the Christ child, just as the candlestick holds and sustains the candle. Of course, it's a naturalistic object. Um, you would need to have a candle and something to hold it in uh, in order to see in the dark. Could it also have an additional symbolic meaning? Now, some people go even further, and this is Carla Gottlieb's uh, idea. She thinks that many of these things in the domestic interior actually represent ecclesiastical or church furnishings. She sees the table as a kind of altar. Uh, frequently in Renaissance painting, and early Netherlandish painting sometimes, um, you will see a polygonal shaped table referring perhaps to the Jewish altar. And so Carla Gottlieb is suggesting that this table represents the altar of the Christian church. Uh, and that, of course, Christ's sacrifice on the cross, which is reenacted on the Christian altar and replaces the animal sacrifice. Now, I have a question. Is she reading too much into a domestic table? You know, does it really have to represent an altar? Is it the old Jewish altar? Is it the new Christian altar? Or is it simply a table holding objects? either to show the skill of the artist in portraying them, or possibly objects that have symbolic meaning. So you need to think about how far can we go with this symbolism. Now here's uh, some symbolism that we've talked about before with Jan van Eyck. Mary is seated before the settle. And the settle is this uh, bench with arms and a backing. And if you can look at the corners of the arms, it has little carved lions. And you remember, um, but back with the master of Visibrot, we talked about the throne of the Virgin that had lions on it. And we talked about Jan van Eyck. We saw that um, many of the um, seats and thrones, they had lions on them. And this was supposed to refer to the throne of Solomon because it was decorated, according to the Old Testament, it was decorated with lions. And because Solomon was supposed to be this very wise king, uh, this then represents the throne of wisdom. And here's a little close-up so you can see one of those lions. Uh, and perhaps uh, it represents Mary uh, as the throne of wisdom. Now, not everybody agrees with that. Uh, Deku wrote an article in 1981. And he basically talked about the settle as a substantial, important piece of furniture. Um, be something that could, you know, would grace a household. They'd be very proud of this piece of furniture. It was practical. Uh, it was expensive. And he said, this is what it is. It's simply showing a, a, the holy figures, what, as though they were living at the time of the artist. And, in the 15th century in the Netherlands, uh, and they have you know, appropriate furniture. He said, you know, you see images of these settles where they do have lions on, where they're not associated with the Virgin Mary. You know, they might be associated with some um, noble person. Now, maybe that had to do with their coat of arms. Maybe it has to do with them saying, you know, oh, I'm so wise, I'm such a wise ruler. <laughs> or maybe they're just purely decorative. And that's what Deku says. It's, it's not symbolic. It's just the way that they carved the furniture. So who's right? Now, we said that Mary is reading. We can't see the word she's reading. Uh, but there are other enunciations where you can. 
And generally you'll see the reading, uh, of course, in Latin, uh, from Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child, which was believed to be a prophecy of the coming of Christ. And you know, she's reading that as it's just about to happen. Um, the fact that she is seated, well, is she seated on the footrest or on the cushion or on the floor. Uh, she's seated in front of the bench with the lions. She's not enthroned on it or uh, seated on it. And so this suggests that she could be seen as the virgin of humility who sits you know, on the ground or uh, close to the ground you know, rather than elevated on a throne. Now, if we look at the back wall, we see other objects which people have interpreted. Uh, one thing, of course, here in the side wall, what we looked at the detail before, we see the uh, unbroken glass of these round windows and the Christ child uh, entering, flying in. I guess he's anticipating that Mary will uh, say, behold the handmaid of the Lord. But there's some other objects. There is this niche uh, with a trefoil arch, and it holds a lava or lava bow, uh, a vessel that contains water. And hanging near it is a long white towel. So this would be you know, where you could wash your hands and dry your hands. And it has already been suggested, we looked at this within Jan van Eyck's Ghent Annunciation, that this represents the purity of the Virgin. And you can see Jan van Eyck's version has a, uh, a trefoil window, which per perhaps uh, would remind us of the Trinity, three persons in one being. Carla Gottlieb also sees this as um, standing in for something ecclesiastical, something related to the church. She sees it as a piscina, uh, where the priest washes his hands before the mass. And because it's got water, there's also the suggestion that maybe it refers to baptism, which is one of the saving sacraments. Uh, that and um, the sacrament of the mass are considered to be saving sacraments because they help people get into heaven. She sees this as transforming the domestic space into a kind of symbolically ecclesiastical space. But is it so? Now, those lavers, those vessels that contain the water and then have spouts and you can tip it either way uh, for the water to come out, those still exist. Uh, I've seen two in different museums, and I'm sure there's many more. Uh, I took a photograph of one of them. So these are actual common domestic items. And we also see those kind of niches in domestic interiors. They do not necessarily have to be ecclesiastical. Uh, the Groot House, um, which is now a museum that is right next to, and in fact attached to, the Church of Our Lady in Bruges, Unza Liebefrau, or Notre Dame, um, it has a niche on the wall, which they have it set up with one of these, these lovers. Um, it's a you know, wealthy man's house. In the background of Durek Bout's Last Supper, or the altarpiece of the Holy Sacrament, uh, there is also uh, in this you know, domestic interior where Christ is having the Last Supper, uh, one of these uh, niches where they have it set up to wash their hands. So it seems like they don't have to be associated with a church. Um, you know, they're common domestic items uh, that someone could have in a house. Do they then have a secondary meaning of purity? because we see them so often associated with the Virgin. Now, let's look at the window. There have been some changes fairly early on. Now, there's, uh, underneath the clouds and the blue sky is what was originally supposed to look like you know, a gold background. It wasn't real gold leaf, that's very expensive, uh, but it was sort of imitation gold leaf because it was a metal foil that then had been coated with a yellow glaze to look like gold. And sometime, probably not long after the painting was painted, uh, someone made it more natural. They painted a blue sky with clouds over this metal foil. They also added the coats of arms one of which has been identified and the other one still we're not sure uh, whose 
coat of arms it is. Uh, we're not completely sure, sure which person it is, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, Gottlieb talks about this golden light. And she starts talking about the invisible Christ. She actually says the invisible Christ. Uh, because there's a lattice here, she says this refers to a Christ as the bridegroom in the Song of Songs who is peering through the lattice. At that point, I think she completely is engaged in uh, speculation. I think she's going too far. There are no invisible figures in paintings. They are a visual medium. Uh, if someone wants to paint Christ looking through the lattice, they will paint Christ looking through the lattice. But Christ is already there. Remember that? We already have Christ. He's not invisible at all. He's the little child with the cross uh, coming through the window, uh, descending on seven golden rays. And most people would say that, well, those seven rays refer to the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is another thing that de Coup finds um, unbelievable. He believes that the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit would be such an obscure thing that it couldn't mean that. But the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit is not something that is obscure in um, Christian life. It's, it's something that's pretty common uh, to know about. Um, even today, even uh, in uh, I, when I was a child in Protestant Sunday school, uh, you know, they mentioned the holy the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So I don't see why he finds that obscure. Um, it seems to me that would be fairly common usage uh, at the time in a Christian society. Now I promise to tell you about the coat of arms. One of the arms is the arms of a family that they sometimes spell the name slightly differently, but uh, the Engelbrocht family, sometimes they spell that I instead of an E. Uh, there's, uh, and there's also an um, Umberg related family in Cologne and in Mechlin. And there are copies of this painting in Germany, which you know, might suggest that it once was in Cologne, uh, perhaps in a church where people could see it. And there are also some connections with Mechelen. So you know, we're not sure, but one of the interesting things someone pointed out was that the name Engelbrock actually means angel brought. The angel brought the good news of the incarnation. Uh, it's almost a, a pun on the name of uh, on what's going on, on the Annunciation. So here's our angel who's bringing the good news of the incarnation. He's just about to open his mouth and speak, presumably, uh, and uh, you know, give us this news. But since the arms are painted over the window frame, we're, over the window panes, we're not sure that that was the original owner. Could the Engelbrock family have acquired it later? Um, or were they the original owners and then you know, they just put the arms up uh, painting over the uh, panes of glass? And here we see the Virgin ready to receive the good news. And to remind you, that's not the only panel there. Now, I've given you some things to think about. Uh, you know, which one of these objects, uh, does the symbolism make sense? Um, do people go a bit too far sometimes in thinking that just every object has to have some symbolic meaning? I want you to think about it. Let's look at the panel with the donors. We see a crenellated wall, a gateway that is open into a view of the little uh, town. There's a man who's taken off his hat uh, in uh, respect, devotion. Uh, he's standing right inside the gateway. 
there are roses. There is a man, once again, holding his hat uh, in respect as he looks, we like to say looks through the doorway. It almost looks like he's looking at the back of the doorway, but at least the idea is that that door is open to the holy scene. And behind him is his wife holding prayer beads, a kind of a proto-rosary. Now, the woman, his wife, and that small standing figure in the background, that mystery man, are additions. They are painted over the original paint. The, there would be more of the garden, the wall beneath them. So one speculation has it that you know the donor ordered this painting and then either when the painting was very well along or when the painting was finished, he got married. And so he wanted to have his wife painted in the painting and so she was she was added to the painting. They're in this you know outside area, this garden area, looking on to the holy scene. Now, sometimes this will be called an enclosed garden, a hortus conclusus, which, as you remember, this is one of the titles that is given to Mary to represent uh, her purity and her virginity. And it comes from Song of Solomon. You know, uh, the bride is the hortus conclusus of the enclosed garden. However, that garden is not completely enclosed. It's got a doorway open to the street, and it's also got a doorway open into the house. So another idea has been attached to this. The relationship between Eve, who brings sin into the world, and death, and they say that Eve closed the gate of paradise to mankind. With human sin, human beings were no longer uh, capable of being virtuous enough to get into heaven. But then Mary, the new Eve, as Christ is the new Adam, uh, Mary opens the gate to paradise by bearing the Christ child uh, and ushering in the incarnation. Now, that comes from, once again, a fairly common source, Jacobus de Voragine. Uh, he was a 13th century cleric who wrote a very famous book called the Legenda Aris, or the Golden Legend. Um, and in this case, legend means readings, so these you know, precious readings about the saints. And he wrote this book as a help to priests who weren't always you know, well-educated. We, you know, we think sometimes about uh, theologians and very famous people, but you know, your local village priest might not have that kind of, would not have that kind of education. So he basically, Virajani takes every day as a different saint's day, and he tells the story, the legend, of the saints. And so you know, you're a priest, you're looking for a teaching or a homily, a sermon to give uh, on your, the saint's day, and here's what you can use as a source. In fact, you'd probably just read out parts of it. It didn't just stay in the hands of clerics. It became a uh, popular book for reading about the saints and was still in use in the 15th century. Okay, we mentioned this little guy who's standing in the background with his hat in hand. He's a mystery man. Who is he? And there have been so many different ideas. One idea was that he was a portrait of the artist. There was Robert Campine himself, whom we don't know what he looked like, um, held, had that idea. Panofsky tells us about it. Uh, another idea was that he was a marriage broker. Uh, that's Rousseau's uh, idea from the Metropolitan Bulletin of 1959. Uh, he's been called a steward, uh, um, the person who could run the estate, or some high-ranking servant that they wanted to include uh, in the painting. 
Minot had an idea that uh, sort of the unifying ideas about this painting came out of the book of Isaiah. So he says, well, maybe it's the prophet Isaiah. Uh, I don't see anything that says prophet. He's not holding a scroll. Um, and of course, Isaiah was sawn in half. Um, there's no attribute there to say that. Nicole, in the Metropolitan um, Museum Bulletin of 1966, has identified the little badge. You can see this little badge he's wearing. It's like a little coat of arms. And he says, this is the badge of the city of Mechlin, and it's what a messenger from Mechlin would be wearing. So, you know, one of the ideas was that maybe the bride was from Mechlin, and uh, this figure of the messenger is a kind of secular analogy to the angel who brings the good news. I don't know who he is. Uh, maybe he's some relative uh, that they wanted to include. Um, but, you know, the truth is we really do not know who he is. Then there's the right wing. The right wing is one of the most interesting parts of this composition. It marks a new idea about St. Joseph. It shows him hard at work in his carpenter's workshop as though he were a Flemish artisan working in his workshop, selling his wares. Uh, you'll notice how they display their goods to be sold. Uh, the shutters don't open from side to side. They are pulled up at the top and held with these little clasps that come down. No. And then the bottom half opens out and you know, would be supported uh, and serves as a kind of shelf on which to display the goods that the artisan is selling. And then the artisan is working hard in his workshop. So it's a new way of representing St. Joseph. During the Middle Ages, Joseph was usually a comic figure. He was a kind of buffoon in the uh, mystery plays. He was the old man who didn't really understand how his young wife got pregnant. Um, and you could say he was cuckolded by God. But by the early 15th century, a number of Franciscan theologians, including John Gerritsen, and in, in Italy, uh, Bernard of Siena, championed Joseph as a very important saint and uh, talked about his virtues. He was the virtuous protector of the Virgin and her divine child. He's a worthy foster parent to Christ. Now, why this change? Well, think about what was happening socially and economically, particularly in these Flemish cities. There was a kind of rise of the middle class. Um, Hardworking craftsmen who provided for their families and Joseph is seen almost as an exemplar of these people. Now, he has additional virtues that they may not have. He is known for his humility. He's known for his continence, his chastity, that he allows Mary to remain ever a virgin. And particularly in the context of, we'll see some other things going on in this picture, Joseph had a role in the salvation of mankind. He deceived the devil. The devil sees a father for Jesus. So he doesn't realize that he's actually Christ God incarnate. So Joseph, by his very presence, deceives the devil into believing that the divine child was a mortal person. Conceived, you know, in the usual manner. Now, I'm showing you these two objects. One 
on the shelf outside. It's displayed kind of as wares to buy. And the other one is still on the workbench. And what those are are mouse traps. You have a spring and the uh, top will come up and then when the mouse goes in and takes the bait, you know, it will slam down on them and capture the mouse. So these are 15th century mouse traps. And uh, incidentally, we do know what 15th century mousetraps are because they're displayed, they're painted in other works of art where it's quite clear. Uh, there is a picture, for example, of a saint in a manuscript who is uh, the patron saint to evoke uh, against mice, <laughs> essentially. And she has uh, mice and uh, mousetraps around her in a particular painting. Uh, it also was said, I think it was the British Museum made one of these and caught a mouse in it. <laughs> Now, who identifies the mousetraps and talks about their symbolic meaning? It's a very famous article as far back as 1945 in the Art Bulletin. Uh, this is Meyer Shapiro's idea. And he points to St. Augustine. And he also talks about you know, Gerritsen's new ideas about St. Joseph. Meyer Shapiro has shown that the mousetraps on display and on the workbench represent the devil's mousetrap. According to Augustine, the flesh of Christ is the bait for the devil. The cross was the devil's mousetrap. The devil exalted at Christ's death, but by that death, Christ conquered the devil and redeemed mankind. That's according to St. Augustine. So, as we said, St. Joseph is playing a role in the salvation of man by deceiving the devil into believing that the divine child was conceived in the ordinary manner. Thus, Joseph is not only the provider and a worthy stepfather for Jesus, but he is the instrument of God's plan to deceive and trap Satan. So he is, in a sense, you know, a, what analogous to the mousetrap. We have to remember, of course, that these artists are portraying, um, we've used the word verisimilitude, but they're portraying uh, naturalistic objects that you know, look real that would be something that you might find around, well, in this case, a carpenter's workshop. So here we're looking uh, in detail at Joseph's workbench. Uh, you have the various tools. You can see some nails, uh, which he's uh, put in a, a little, looks like a little uh, clay bowl. Uh, there's some others which are scattered on the table. Uh, there's the wood shavings from where he's been working and making things. And you can see the awl. Uh, and you will also see that he is working with an awl. Uh, we look through the window. We see this very detailed cityscape, all these Netherlandish naturalistic details uh, with the mousetrap uh, on the shelf outside. Uh, make it a little larger so you can see it better. Now, another idea that's been expressed in some of the articles is uh, Cynthia Hahn's idea. She sees the Holy Family as a kind of marriage model. Uh, that they're, you know, it's like the ideal perfect marriage. And of course, talks about Joseph's new role, you know, as you know, a, a worthy uh, provider, a virtuous man. Now, one of the other things that's kind of interesting is, is what is Joseph doing? He's got a drill out here. Uh, he's making holes in a piece of wood. And that has sparked a lot of speculation about what could Joseph be making. Uh, Meyer Shapiro wrote an article in which he suggested that it was the lid of a bait box, you know, like you would have uh, carry bait for going fishing, uh, and uh, carried on this idea of the flesh of Christ as the bait for the devil. Uh, Panofsky uh, thought a slightly humorous idea. He thought that it might be the top of a foot warmer in which you would have uh, a little box, uh, which presumably had, you know, was metal lined or metal, uh, uh, that would have the hot coals put in it, and then you'd have this perforated uh, lid on it. You could, you know, a hinge, and you could lift up, and you could put your feet on it because, of course, Joseph had cold feet <laughs> about marrying the Virgin Mary until an angel came and told him it was all right. 
Um, Freeman had the idea that it was uh, a spike board. In many paintings of the Christ carrying the cross to Golgotha, uh, particularly German paintings, uh, you'll see him being tormented on the way. And one thing is that around his neck is draped on you know, a long cord, a board with spikes driven through it. And they are supposed to smash against his shins and his knees and bloody him and torment him as he walks uh, the road to the cross. That's the spike board. So an instrument by which Christ could be uh, tortured and um, reminding us of the passion of Christ, reminding us of the sacrifice and sufferings of Christ. Marilyn Levine suggests that uh, it is a strainer for a wine press and then has Eucharistic symbols, symbolism. And there are many pictures of Christ in the wine press. However, um, they usually don't just show the strainer uh, you know, where you can see it. Uh, and you know what's telling us that this is a strainer? Well, the other idea is that it might be a fire screen. And you may remember, I was going to bring in my detail. I had one made. I just didn't get it in. But you may remember that there is a fire screen in the pictures of the Virgin Mary. You may remember that there is a fire screen in the center panel, the Annunciation, uh, which is behind the settle that's in front of the fireplace. And this is a board that has perforations in it. It's supposed to keep uh, the heat uh, to be not too intense on the person who's uh, sitting close to the fire, but allow some of the heat to get through it. And it is a board with uh, holes bored in it, very much like what Joseph is doing. In that idea, they think that this then becomes a kind of symbol for the continence of Joseph and uh, the chaste marriage of the Virgin and St. Joseph. Uh, the heat then being analogous to the passion, uh, not the passion of Christ in this case, but the passion of sex, uh, not the suffering, but uh, the, the heat of lust, for example, which Joseph uh, is able to resist and uh, here is creating a fire screen that will shield Mary from uh, not only the fire in the fireplace, uh, but from uh, you know, the unwanted attentions and maintain her virginity. And then I wanted to take a look at the tools which are at Joseph's feet. We see here a saw, some kind of rod or staff, and an ax, a trimming ax. Minot has discovered a verse in the Bible that names these three objects. Now, they might be things that you would expect to find around a carpenter's workshop, but it is intriguing that we've got a book it, we've got a verse in the Bible that names all of them, and they all three are here right there in the foreground. Um, you know, a saw, an axe, but why a rod? You know, it doesn't look like a measuring rod. So it seems that perhaps he's right that this verse in Isaiah may be the reason that these three objects are displayed so prominently. Isaiah 10, 15 tells about the vainglorious Assyrians who are used as the instruments of divine wrath. And in that verse, they're likened to the ax, the saw, and the staff or rod, boasting against the person who uses them. In other words, the tool is saying that you know, they're the ones who, has, how, who have conquered. Um, you know, they're the ones who are doing the work rather than the person who actually uses the tools and God is using the Assyrians as an instrument of his wrath. Now, when Minot talks about this, as you can see the art bulletin in 1969, he compared the arrogance of the Assyrians to a heretic or to the devil. And he brings in the verse from Isaiah that says uh, that, uh, you know, the earth is the footstool of the Lord. And he says, well, the earth is the realm of the devil. So he sees these as referring to the devil. I must admit, I don't see it that way. I'm looking at what the actual verse that he found says. One, the book, I'm looking at what the actual 
Bible verses are saying. The verse about the earth as the footstool of the Lord doesn't say the earth is the devil's realm. It says that the earth is the footstool of the Lord who orders all to his will. You know, God is in control. He's, you know, over the earth. And when he's talking about the boasting axe, saw, and the rod, he's talking about how, you know, the vainglorious Assyrians, they're only tools in the hand of God. Just as Satan you know, thinks he's won, he's boasting, he's a tool in the hand of God. So I'm reading those instruments a little bit differently. I'm suggesting that the arrogance of the boasting axe and saw and rod contrast with the humility of Joseph, who is a tool for the Lord, and you know his humility um, prompts him to do what God wants. Well, that's a lot of detail about the details in the painting and what people have seen as symbolic objects. So, you know, you need to think about that and decide how far do you want to go with the symbolism? Do you think Deku is right and, and people are just making this stuff up? They're not reading it, reading it correctly. It's really just naturalistic objects. Um, do you think that some of them have symbolic meaning and enrich the meaning of the painting? Which ones do the objects almost tell you, you know, that they are um, meaning something beyond I'm a, a flower or I'm a tool here? Um, or is it can people go too far and start reading things in uh, to these paintings that the, the artist and the presumably uh, a theologian or an, iconogra uh, an iconographic advisor we sometimes call them you know there might have been uh, a person who uh, suggested some of these things you know a learned person um, that maybe they're going too far for even what someone in the 15th century might have known or planned. What do you think? Now, I told you that besides iconography, which as you can see, there's a lot of literature on that, there also have become questions of primacy, in other words, which painting came first, uh, which is by the master's hand, and attribution, and that means which artist painted the painting? Well, don't we know it was painted by Robert Campine? Actually, uh, it has been attributed to Campine, but we have no paintings that say Campine on the painting or the frame or no document that describes a painting exactly. You'll remember um, how we decided that Robert Campine painted the so-called Flamal paintings. And from those paintings, other works were attributed to Campine. There is a series of books that is put out by the um, Institut Royal du Patrimoine Artistique, the Royal Institute of Artistic Patrimony, or as they're now saying, of Cultural Heritage, in Brussels. And what they do is they talk about the groups. So for example, the campaign group. Works of art that have been attributed to campaign that have similarities. And then art historians sometimes argue about them. They might say that something is a campaign follower rather than the master's hand, or it comes out of his workshop. Uh, and it may be one of the assistants that we know he had in his workshop. Sometimes they'll name someone. Maybe it's one of um, his pupils that who became a master like Jacques Darrah or uh, Roger van der Weyden. There were two very famous annunciations that seem to be but almost in the same room, you know, very, very similar. They come out of the camp, that are in the Campine group uh, that seem to have a relationship to Robert Campine and his workshop. 
One of them is the Maroda Annunciation in New York. And the other one is in Brussels. And so the question becomes, which came first? Which one influenced the other? Well, for a long time, we all thought that the Maroda altarpiece with all of these interesting naturalistic details was what might call the original. And that the Brussels painting was a simplified version of the Maroda Annunciation. However, technology has given us new information and it's shown us something that we didn't expect. And so we have to change our ideas. Infrared reflectography, you'll remember that, is the method by which we can see through the picture surface and pick up underdrawings that are, that are created in some kind of carbon-based medium. And both of these have been examined with infrared reflectography. And I, I don't have a picture to show you here, but the underdrawings in the Brussels Annunciation show many changes. Uh, things that are, you know, made larger or you know, changed around. Positions changed. Which we believe shows the creative process. The artist who puts something in and then changes his mind and is, you know, thinks, oh, this will work better. You don't see those changes in the Moroda Annunciation. And we would assume that if somebody is copying a painting, they're, you know, they they don't have to make all sorts of changes. They know how big to make the fireplace, for example, and where to position it. Uh, you know, they're copying something. And surprisingly, well, well, it was surprising, but now we know it to be so. The Brussels Annunciation shows the kind of changes that we would expect when a master is painting a painting. Um, and, you know, he's changing his mind about things. So now we believe that the Brussels Annunciation, even though it is simpler, it doesn't have all of these different objects, as some of them, we believe that is the one that was, you know, inspired perhaps the Maroda altarpiece. Now, it's also possible that there's some lost paintings, too, um, you know, that could come between the Brussels and the Maroda altarpiece. And many believe that this was created by Master Robert Campine. And they point out how, when you just look at the Brussels Annunciation, the spatial relationships are much more logical. Um, you do have some things about the table tipping up. You have that in most pictures, but it's not quite so severe in the Brussels Annunciation. The forms seem to go back into space rather than just be tipped up uh, a bit more. And for example, Mary is seated. We can see what she's sitting on. She's sitting on a pillow. We understand where she is and you know, where her knees are and uh, you know, she makes sense. And the draperies don't obscure the body, they reveal the position of the body beneath the draperies. In other words, someone who is a little bit more skilled at showing space, spatial relationships, and uh, understanding how the body works and how that affects the draperies above it. Now, here you can see certainly similarities. Uh, there is the mantelpiece in uh, the Maroda altarpiece. Uh, the style of the sconces is just a little bit different. Uh, they both have uh, figures of a male and female figure. You have the, uh, the male was cut out in my detail in the Brussels mantelpiece. Uh, and the Brussels mantelpiece has one object that is not in the New York or the Maroda Annunciation. It's this uh, woodcut, which is painted. Uh, and hung up on the mantel. It's a woodcut of St. Christopher. 
Now, someone has pointed out that it resembles the Buxheim St. Christopher, uh, which has a date on it of 1423. Seen that before. And so they suggest that the painting must be slightly later than the Buxheim St. Christopher. Now, I think you can see that that's not exactly the same print. It could be a different print with the same subject, um, but they're indicating that perhaps it's close in style and in time to the Buxheim St. Christopher. Um, and suggesting that perhaps this is a little later than we thought. You know, we thought the painting was 1425-ish, <laughs> somewhat in 1420s. Uh, and, uh, it says maybe it's actually in the second half rather than the first half of the 1420s. Um, well, maybe. And, you know, it's not absolute because this does not absolutely copy that print. It's a similar type. And I'm going to show you some corresponding details. We saw the lions on the settle in the Moroda Annunciation. In Brussels, they have a lion and a dog. Well, could that represent the fidelity, the faith of the Virgin? And the faith of Joseph, perhaps, too. Uh, or is it just simply decoration? You know, just what you would carve, what you would have uh, on one of these uh, wonderful pieces of furniture. And here you can compare the angels. You see the Moroda faces are a little fleshier. They're a little uh, softer and more round. Uh, and the, uh, the Brussels angels has uh, what, uh, slightly sharper features, but both accomplished. And the same thing is true uh, of the Virgin. We said that um, the position of the Moroda Virgin, as uh, Lauren Campbell says, is indeterminate. You know, is she on the footrest? Is she on the floor? Is she on a big pillow, which we can't see? Uh, you know, how exactly is she arranged? Where's her other knee? How does that work? <laughs> Um, the Brussels Virgin, you see very clearly where her knees are and what she's doing. She's seated on a big pillow, and you can just see the edge of it, uh, peeking out beneath her clothing, beneath her mantle. And she's sort of uh, using the, uh, the bench itself as a, a kind of backrest. So it's clear. Uh, faces, once again, you see the same thing, that the Moroda Virgin has a very volumetric, uh, seemingly fleshy, Face. And the Brussels Virgin is perhaps a bit more dainty. So, are these the same artist? Are they out of the same workshop? Is one of them a campaign and the other one a follower? Well, Lauren Campbell has decided that the Moroda triptych is not by campaign. He thinks that it's by a follower of campaign whom he calls the master of the Moroda triptych. And to this Moroda master, Campbell also attributed the Virgin with a fire screen in London and the whirl altar wings. Now, think about that last one for a moment. If the whirl altar wings are not by Campean, then we have no dated paintings by Campean. We have something from the Campean group, as it were. So the question then becomes, are they by the same workshop, by the same master? And then there's even a further question. Some people have suggested that the Moroda Annunciation is by a different hand than the wings. That the wings show more accomplished space, uh, more accomplished uh, understanding of the human figures, and that they're painted by a different person. In fact, one person has suggested that it's the young Roger van der Weyden. Campbell believes the Moroda altarpiece is a pastiche of campaign motifs taken from various pictures and put together. Now, what a pastiche is, is when you are taking elements from, in this case, different works of art, and you're making a new work of art out of it. And then, of course, we have that question, um, you know, could the Moroda wings be by a different artist? Now, they could be by different artists in the same studio. That's one possibility. You know, that uh, the master assigns different people Dora, Willamette, Roger van der Weyden, if it is campaign studio, or other people if it's a follower of campaign. Or it's possible that uh, the donor acquired this 
painting. And then the new owner had wings attached to it showing himself and then later his wife uh, and Saint Joseph. It's a lot of questions. There seem to be a number of different styles which are included in the campaign group. So, you know, now many people say that, well, that Brussels painting must be by campaign. But, you know, other people have thought that it's from someone who is working in the campaign workshop. Uh, Jacques Dorat has been suggested. Uh, and another artist who seems to be related to campaign, uh, the master of the Hortus Conclusus, uh, named after this uh, saints in a garden at the National Gallery in Washington. So there's lots of attribution questions uh, when we're dealing with Robert Campine. Okay. Some of you are students and you say, well, what should I call it on an exam? <laughs> well, I will certainly accept Robert Campine for any of the things in the Campine group, as it were. So if you want to call the Moroda altarpiece Robert Campine, I certainly will count that correct on an exam. If you want to agree with Lauren Campbell and say it's a follower of Campine, or the master of the Moroda Annunciation, well, I'll accept that as well. It will be interesting to see in the future if uh, art historians ever come to an agreement about this or remain divided. I want to show you one more painting from the Campine group. And this is another one of the paintings that Lauren Campbell now uh, believes is by the same artist who painted the Moroda Annunciation. So if you think that's Campine, it's by Campine. If you think it's the Master of the Moroda Annunciation, it's by the Master of the Moroda Annunciation. Uh, it's also, it's known as the Virgin and Child or the Madonna with a fire screen, which you see behind her head. Uh, this one is not carved board, it is woven and forms a large circle and you just see a little bit of the fire uh, coming up behind it. So it's you know, protecting her from that intense heat. Uh, it's also known as the Salting Madonna or the Salting Virgin and Child uh, because it was in the Salting Collection before the National Gallery of Art in London acquired it. And most people will put this just maybe a little bit later than some of the other campaigns where they were thinking they were about 1425 and they say, okay, maybe this was 1430. We really um, don't know exactly. And once again, on examinations, if you, know, you were to choose 1425 for this, uh, it's within the realm of possibility. Uh, we're not being too hard on exact dates. Uh, you should get them within the realm when the artist is active or the presumptive artists are active. Now, the condition is interesting here. You'll notice uh, I have a picture here where the top and as we look at it, the right side of the painting, uh, the bits have been cut out. And I did this deliberately because this is what we have of the original painting. Uh, the painting is on oak and there were strips of walnut attached to the top and the right. And there's just the trace of some scorching. So they think what happened is that this painting must have been in a fire and uh, parts of it damaged. And so they think in the 19th century, uh, these strips of a totally different type of wood, walnut, were added uh, to, you know, so they could preserve the part that survived of the painting uh, and you know, repair it. Of course, you notice that there was uh, a very elaborate piece of furniture with a chalice on it, which is completely cut off. Those were 19th century additions. And what's interesting is how people talk about particularly that chalice. Um, some people assume that that copy is an accurate copy, that it's showing what Campine or the Master of the Moroda triptych painted in the Virgin with the fire screen that he included a chalice, which of course has a, a Eucharistic connotation. There is a old painting 
which no longer can be located, but a black and white, not terribly clear photograph was taken in 1926. And it shows not a chalice, but a simple brass bowl in a copy after the Virgin with a fire screen. So we don't know whether that copy was showing what was actually there in the original painting, or was the copy simplifying it? So, you know, was there a chalice originally? Was there a, a bowl originally? Just something, you know, homey and domestic? Or was there something else? Or maybe there was nothing, you know, just um, the Virgin's elbow resting on a piece of furniture. We can see how the fire screen serves as a kind of naturalistic halo. Mary doesn't have a gold disc halo or a ring of gold around her head, uh, but we have this uh, naturalistic object that you know, serves the same uh, function, but isn't you know what an ordinary object, yeah. but you know marks her out. You'll notice the child is looking at us. He wasn't in the underdrawing. So let's look at some details here. Um, there is a book that is open, uh, lying on the cushions. Uh, oftentimes when we see the Christ child in association with a book, uh, sometimes actually touching and leafing through it, uh, here, of course, it's a little separated. separated. Uh, we think of the Christ child as the word. Uh, St. John talks about, uh, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And of course, in Latin, the word is verbum, and in uh, Greek, it's logos. So the Christ child is the logos or the verbum. We still see our carved lions on the settle, make of them what you wish, whether it's a reference to Mary as the throne of wisdom or simply a lovely piece of furniture that uh, you might find among a uh, middle class or upper middle class household uh, or you know, a wealthy household as well uh, in the 15th century. We can look out of the, the window and see this view going you know, clear back to hills. Uh, and we're looking at, uh, there seems to be a wall around the building where the Virgin is. And then there's a, a broad street and houses across the way. Uh, somebody's doing some roof repairs. They're climbing up this very tall ladder. Others are riding by on their horses or walking down the street. And we can also see the village or the city church, maybe, the, uh, maybe a cathedral. It's a very lovely uh, Gothic church there. Now, I wanted to talk to you about the nursing virgin. You'll notice here that Mary is showing her breast. She's you know, offering her breast to the Christ child, but the Christ child isn't really looking at the breast. Uh, he's not nursing. Uh, we saw um, Jan van Eyck's nursing Christ child with the Luca Madonna. But here, the child is looking out at us. Now, in the underdrawing, he was turned more toward the breast. That's been a change that the artist has made. Uh, so that there's this kind of eye contact with the viewer, with the person who's saying his prayers in front of this picture. And very frequently, when we see pictures of Mary offering her breast or nursing the Christ child, we see those as intercessory pictures, referring to the donor's hope for salvation. Now, why is that? Well, I'm going to show you some later paintings because those are the ones you know, that I have, uh, some early 16th century paintings uh, that I have reproductions of. Uh, but there are examples of this in earlier art. In many, well, in some paintings of the Last Judgment, you will see a picture of the Virgin Mary at the right hand of Christ, interceding for the souls of mankind. That's her job. She is chief intercessor, and she's trying to get more human beings saved. And sometimes you'll see these images where Mary is bearing her breast, or sometimes both breasts. Uh, and essentially, you know, she's saying, I nursed you. 
I, I took care of you when you were a baby. You know what? I'm your mother. <laughs> you, know, you owe me. You should do what your mother says. And she is showing, they said that, you know, he, in, in, he, he took in with his nourishment, he took in the mercy of the virgin. Um, so, you know, she's mercifully pleading for the salvation of more souls. You know, I'm your mother. Can't you just save another soul for me? Uh, I sometimes call uh, Mary uh, the ultimate Jewish mother. You know, she'll, she'll uh, what, uh, nag him until he does what she wants. And here is the entire picture. This, of course, is much later, probably about 100 years later, approximately, than uh, the salty Madonna. But it gives you the idea of Mary you know, showing her breast and interceding. Uh, I have another one, which is also early 16th century. Uh, this is actually by Roger van der Weyden's grandson, uh, his, uh, son of Peter van der Weyden, the son of Roger van der Weyden, who all became artists. And it is a kind of, I, I always call it an intercessory triptych. It's in uh, Antwerp. Uh, and it shows you the abbot, Anthony Scroton. Uh, and he's kneeling, and Mary is showing her breast to Christ in the next panel, who's turning uh, toward God the Father. And you have all of these instruments of the passion. Uh, you know, Mary saying, you know, I nursed you. Um, Christ is showing how he suffered uh, for the salvation of mankind, including the abbot. And uh, that prayer is being passed on to God the Father, who, you know, presumably the abbot hopes that he will grant that prayer for salvation. There is a kind of parallel between Mary showing her breast and Christ displaying his wound and pointing to the blood. Um, in a sense, when Mary was nursing the child. She was feeding him with her own blood because uh, during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, it was believed that breast milk was transmuted blood. In other words, you have this fluid in the body that is blood. Uh, another fluid comes out, which is milk. How did that happen? Uh, somehow the one fluid must have been changed to the other. And you can see that this could have um, very interesting ideas with uh, theology and symbolism, uh, where you know, Christ has shed his blood for uh, mankind, and there's a kind of parallel in Mary nurturing with her uh, breast milk. So this is part of the uh, idea of intercession. And you know, what we say is, in this case, it's made stronger because the child is not actually looking at the breast, he's looking out at the viewer. Yeah. He's drawing us in. Uh, Mary is pointing her breast at us. So, you know, there's, there's this kind of idea of, um, you know, she will intercede for us. And as we said, Lauren Campbell believes that both the Moroda Annunciation and the Virgin with the Fire Scream are by the same artist. I'll show you a detail in a minute. I think we'll confirm that. Um, they might, are they both, as most people have thought for a long time, uh, both Robert Campine or someone in the Campine workshop, or are they a Campine follower whom Lauren Campbell calls the master of the Moroda triptych? And here I'm just showing you the faces, and you can see both of them have that kind of uh, fleshy, uh, volumetric quality. The faces are shaped very, very, very similar. Um, so, yes, it seems they are, they, they are by the same hand. Uh, who is that hand? Campine? Someone in his workshop? Or a follower? And that is uh, one of the thorny attribution questions that people are dealing with today.